Introducing our panelists, here we have Melody Lovern and Dean Busby. They were both presenters here today. And we have Patty Litchfield. She's a member of our planning committee here in St. George, a longtime supporter of UCAP and the mother of seven. And we have Dan Gray, who is a therapist in the Salt Lake area, as well as a member of the UCAP board. So we're going to jump in with some questions for them. And then, like I said, feel free to come on up to the mic at any point if you would like. So all of these questions are open to anyone who would like to answer. So jump in when you'd like to. Here's the first question. For married and older people with sex addictions, how can you best determine who to include in your support circle and what to share? So this could be including parents, siblings, friends, in-laws, et cetera. Anyone? Start that. Um, <clears throat> that's a really good question. And I, I think the, the answer probably applies to basically at least my answer to everyone who is going through that uh, process because the criteria for those that are older isn't, in my opinion, you know, any much different than those that are younger as well. Um, we basically suggest that you choose people that are, you're going to bring into your circle, someone that first of all you can trust, that they're going to be able to keep the information confidential, uh, that it's someone that uh, you have a real good sense for their ability to keep it contained in, a, in, in your sphere of, of uh, uh, well, wh wherever you direct them, that that's where they're going to go. If you say, you can share this with your family, or you can share this with a certain number of, of or certain individuals in our sphere, then they're going to be uh, willing to do that. You can trust them. The other one is, have they earned the right to know? Uh, are they someone that you feel that you have enough, and a connection, enough of a connection with that, that you can have an ongoing relationship with them if they hear something from you that is disturbing for you, for, for them? Um, and so have they earned that can you trust them? And if, in that sharing, is it someone that you feel is going to help you? Uh, why share with them if you don't feel that it's gonna be a benefit to you? Don't share simply because someone is kind of pressuring you or that they're asking all the questions. Uh, because when information gets out, it can be very, very damaging if you're not able to keep it relatively contained. So it's someone who has earned that right to know, someone you can trust, and someone that you feel is going to help you in some way by you disclosing this information to them. That was a great answer. You've answered that question before. A couple of times. Yeah, okay. So here's our next question. Uh, thanks for that one. How to find a balance between using smartphone filters and letting people exercise their agency and accountability? Let me take a, a first stab at that. I, uh, we, we talk a lot about how to set limits with children. And I think, uh, I think uh, personally, I treat my home the same way I treat my classroom. That is, I'm responsible for the environment. So what comes into that house is my responsibility. And I feel empowered to set those limits and keep those limits for the rest of my life. So if my child is living in my home, I feel pretty comfortable setting the filters and the boundaries around the material that comes in regardless. I mean, I try to have it be a conversation where we talk about it together. I don't make all the decisions unilaterally, but overall, I feel like my wife and I have the, have the responsibility and, and duty to set those filters as we feel best. Good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, are there local support groups at no cost for those who struggle with addiction, and what about those whose partners struggle? So actually, looking around here, not that many of our panelists are from this area. Patty, you are. Do you happen to know? Yeah, that, there's, lot, there's lots of li different agencies. Um, um, the, the church has the, uh, there's a lot of addiction recovery programs. Um, 
uh, addiction recovery programs, and then Lifestar, and I don't know, Friends, and I don't know, UCAP, look at this, this conference. Oh. Good, thank you. Um, another resource possibly for the person who asked this question or for anyone else who shares the same question are all of our exhibitors who have booths here yeah. today. So hopefully you can find some resources there. Yeah. Yep. Good, next question. How should I respond or react to finding porn on my spouse's computer? I'm thinking, you know, from a spouse's perspective, but I'm also thinking how we want to uh, talk and speak to our kids if we find it too. And so we don't want to shame and blame um, however, we need a safe space to be able to process this, and it's usually not our spouse when we find this that would probably be the person that we need to, to uh, process this. So finding a safe place and a safe person to process, you know, the hurt that comes with finding pornography, but also wanting to handle this well, and that you want to be able to go to your spouse and say, I found this you know, what's going on, what's maybe behind that, because again, porn is that symptom, but we want to get to what's behind that. Are you stressed out at work or, you know, um, some, other, some other questions. I think leaning in with curiosity is going to be usually your, your better um, outcome than, um, you know, trying to fix or blame or shame, things like that. That's great. So it sounds like what you're saying is that um, ideally we'll be able to get to a place where we can approach it with mm -hmm. curiosity yeah. because that will be more likely to result in a situation we want to be in in the future. And so maybe we need to process it with somebody else. Yes. So we don't, yeah, okay. I think anytime we come from a place of just assuming and, and going into a blame, we're going to create a place of defensiveness. And so just being able to say at some point, hey, I found this on your computer. You know, is there something that you want to share with me? Or, hey, is there something going on? You know, that creates a lot safer environment for them to share what it is that they need to share. Thank you. All right. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, I concur with that. I think it's also important to allow yourself your emotions and your feelings when you first discover this. Because it can be a, a shattering experience. There can be that great sense of loss of trust that's been there for so long. A loss, then a feeling, a loss of a dream. I thought we were this kind of couple. I thought that he loved me. I thought that, that he only desired me. And now I find that he's uh, then seeking this type of satis satisfaction elsewhere. Uh, there can be that feeling of loss, and we know with the uh, stages of loss that come comes with what comes with that is some guilt or anger maybe guilt like I am not enough I haven't been enough of a wife here and so I must I must be flawed and then with that issue of blame many times the the addict or the one who's using the pornography will kind of shift that blame to you somehow implying that you were not enough or all these years you know i've been telling you that we haven't had enough sex or we we haven't been close enough what else am i supposed to do so that that blame can shift so not blaming him is is important at that point but also not blaming yourself and allowing yourself to experience the anger or the hurt but have some place to process that as well, Thank going you. to the resources to be able to work through those emotions. Excellent. Can I add to that? Yes, please. Maybe share a mic if that one's not. So I'm just going to add that it could be a male, it could be a, a male spousing, recognizing a female spousing it, or vice versa. Um, I was going to add that if it's a child that happens to see it, one of the most critical parts is n not the shaming but it's also allowing a child to explore the feelings and emotions produced by the viewing. They shouldn't just ignore the reality that premature sexualization can take place in the viewing and parents can help them process that without feeling ashamed by what they viewed and help them understand those viewing are gonna trigger emotions. Those are emotions are appropriate. They just need to be at the right time in the right place. Excellent, thank you. Do we have any questions from our audience? I have lots here. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I have, no, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and share this microphone. Um, I just have a couple of questions really quick. Um, what if you have, 
because you didn't know lack of knowledge, lack of experience, because you never experienced this before, you have shared information inappropriately, and it's kind of come back to bite you. What if you did everything wrong? You responded inappropriately, did everything totally wrong. And then the, my other, other question is, is how prevalent is mother blame? I mean, um, you know, for instance, you know, mom, mom is just blamed for all of it, you know, from the kids, from the wife, everything. Um, for, I had one, one son went to a family class in college, family life class, and came home saying that he was raised in a really bad home. Um, that's how come he resorted to pornography when his other brothers raised in the same home didn't have any problem with pornography. And yet, in this class, the professor um, basically handed out information that his that made him believe that his problems came because of his parents and the way he was raised. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's start with your first question, which, um, if I and if I understand what you meant, what if what do we do with the regret of maybe not handling things as well as we would have liked to, and what if there are repercussions coming back to us because we didn't handle it well because we didn't know better? Is that a good summary of your question? Anyone want to take that one? I'll just say that you know many times when I'm when I'm walking with a woman, one of the first things that I say to her is. You didn't cause this, you can't control it, nor can you cure it. However, you can begin the process of really dealing with these emotions and the trauma that you've experienced within the primary relationships. And, and the sooner that she can get to processing these emotions, having a safe place to process that, the better off she's gonna be. And some women handle this well, and some women you know, when our emotions get the, the better of us, we don't always handle this well. So just like there might be a spouse who's struggling with pornography and really getting to the roots of what's driving that behavior, here's an opportunity for us to say, you know, I, did, I didn't handle this well. You know, that um, this is not a safe place for me right now and I don't trust you. And so I, I, my goal is to, to handle these proce and process these emotions well, but that doesn't mean that we're always gonna do that. So it is an opportunity for you just to, to step in and own um, you know, that you didn't handle it well. Um, can I go in and speak to the second question? Please do, so um, about mother blame. The, the, mother, the mother blame, you know, part of the beauty of counseling, and again, I'm a life coach, so I'm not a counsel, counselor, but part of the process of counseling is being able to go back so that you can go forward. And so naming things that have happened in our past is very, very important, so that when we are trying to thrive in our current relationships, we can understand some of our past so that we can be the better version of ourselves. However, it's not ever an opportunity to go back and blame. It's really to better understand our wiring, how we grew up, how we handle conflict, so that we can, you know, steward these experiences and hopefully better these opportunities for the future. So, you know, I just want to speak to we all grow up in brokenness and we all are recovering from the fall and so there is no perfect home and, and I think you just you kind of answered your own question that there are kids in your home that haven't struggled with pornography and have grown up in the same home as your son so I would just maybe I guess just love him where he is right now so that maybe he can move from that blaming place to maybe naming it and moving forward great answer I was gonna add in the therapeutic healing process of any type of addiction one of the most critical factors is self-ownership. And healing takes place when, we, when any individual dealing with a difficulty begins to see what they need to do to change. So if you're still dealing with children that want to blame mom and dad, that's a defense mechanism where they haven't reached, quite reached the step of healing where they need to. Um, of course, parents can always say, I'm sorry and apologize. None of us is an expert in the room. Even with all my education, I've made wonderful mistakes with my children, you know. And so my main comment to my sons and to my daughter is, I'm sorry. You didn't come with a manual, and I'm doing the best that I can. But also help them understand that the biggest step in healing is self-acceptance and self-change. So we can find any reason to blame anybody else. But if we truly want to change, it's internalization and realizing that, that that's our issue and we need to change. 
Thank you. Do we have any? Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Just to reiterate that point, I think it's really keen and important that if we do realize and we hear things that we we really have kind of messed up on, maybe as parents, because we all make mistakes, don't we? And that in that process, we're if we own some things that we've done, that, yeah, I'd like to have been able to be more attentive to your needs when you were younger. Or maybe I was absent, I was too busy with my work or church business or whatever it was, and I, I wish that I had been at home more. I wish I had been more attentive to your needs and heard your voice and listened. And for that, I, to that point, I'm very sorry for having not done that. But in that process, we're also modeling to them how to take ownership for mistakes that are made. And so if we're modeling that, we can then show them that they can also then take responsibility for the mistakes and choices they've made because they have this model that they're able to follow. Great, okay, thanks. Do we have any other questions right now from our audience? Our next written question, I love this one. How do we help bear the burdens of others without being consumed by them? You know, I'm gonna take this from a clinical standpoint. As a therapist, one of the things we have to learn when we first become therapists is that if we took home everything that we were told in our office, we wouldn't be very effective at home. And in my early years as a therapist, I had to visualize that when people told, because I specialize in treating individuals that are sexually abused as children, when I listened to those horrific stories, I had to visualize that as I walked out of my clinical door, those stories stayed in my office, and then they were there for me when I came back to my office. Where if I had taken them home with me, it would have probably affected my life in ways that it shouldn't. And so one of the things to realize is when you're helping someone, rule number one, don't cross over into the line of therapy. If you're a lay person trying to assist and support, remember there's a time when a clinical therapist needs to get involved. Um, there's reasons we have all the education and license and skills that we have. There's a difference between supporting and doing therapy and oftentimes, especially in a lay culture, we see religious leaders or individuals seeking to do therapy when they really shouldn't. They just need to be supportive and supportive means they love them but it doesn't mean that you get into the details and try to offer counsel. It means you love and support and help seek them resources. So one of the most critical factors you can do is let them know they're loved, let them know you don't have answers, and let them know you're gonna help them get the support that they need because there really are good helping clinical professionals to assist you with those that you love so you don't cross over in areas that may potentially cause more damage than good even though you're intending to do good. Any questions from our audience? Next question, how can I, as one person, fight pornography? I think, um, I think uh, there's a variety of ways you can do this. Of course, we can make our voices known in what we watch, even if it's not really pornography, but it's sliding in that direction. Um, we can make our our voices count in the things that we protest. Um, we can make our um, our voices matter in the way that we support people who are uh, trying to um, develop healthy sexuality in this world. Um, you know that that we we come to things like this. We participate in activities that we think strengthen our community and. Um, um, I think the most important way is with the people closest to us in our environment that we, we try our best to love them and support them through this struggle and teach them the opposites of pornography, what a healthy relationship looks like, what, um, what love is and, and what it can be. I think those are the, the most important things. I think that um, an important thing we need to do is not give up hope. I know um, for a while I felt like pornography is bigger than God. And 
and uh, then you see the statistics and you think, oh my gosh, that's just too big. Who can solve these problems? How can it help? But um, in my thinking, and you know, I'm a religious person, but I realized um, if God made the earth and he made everything in the earth, the dandelions, the mountains, the seas, it's bigger than pornography. So um, for me, I turn to a higher power and turn it over to him, and I know that through him, and he will help. He, he, he wants to fight pornography, and he wants to keep our people safe, and so I think get the word out, don't give up hope, and come to these things like this, and band together with people with um, similar views and, and feelings. Sorry, we're sharing mics here. That's okay, sorry. Doing the best we can. Um, foundationally for all of us is human connection. What turns people into electronic viewing and other areas feeling alone or lost? Think about our world today. One of the most powerful things we can do is that foundational human connection that takes away some of those needs to seek connection someplace else. So all the things that they said, but one thing I would add is just make sure that human connection, I mean, just as simple as when you go through a grocery store line, are you on your phone or do you talk to the clerk that's waiting on you? Do you look at people in the eye when you're walking on a college campus or are you walking around on your phone? Human connection is really missing in our society and needs to come back. I was just gonna add, I think so many times too, to to just keep in mind that, you know, God is writing a good, good story for each one of us. Um, and that just like we experienced as we read in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, that the enemy is constantly coming to kill, steal, and destroy. And he wants to share a narrative with us um, that God is not good, that he's holding out on us, just like he did with Eve. And so I think just again, she, she mentioned human connection, but also just remembering how, when I am alone, isolated, living in secrets and silence, that's, that's like the bedrock of addiction and shame. And so stepping into human connection, stepping into people who are gonna love me, encourage me to be the better version of myself, I think is, is going to be another place that's going to help us on this journey because temptation's not going away, but what are we doing in that and around that and with others as we're walking through that? So great. Thanks for your input. And I can't let this one go by without swinging for it. You ask how to fight pornography, and I'm the director of UCAP, so I'm going to make a plug. Um, I think that events like this really can make a difference. Um, if we can band together with other people who recognize the problem that pornography is, then we can feel strengthened by each other. We gain the resources at conferences like this to go back and to support people around us. So if you would like to help fight pornography, one way to do that is by supporting UCAP. And I know you've gotten several plugs today for financial support. Also, we're always looking for volunteers to do data entry and just you know some clerical jobs from home. If you ever want to put in some volunteer hours, you can email me at info at utahcoalition.org. Sorry for being so specific, but I just had to. Okay, um, next question. What are some warning signs that I should see as red flags that my child might be struggling with a pornography addiction? At least start that. Um, I mean, there are many different signs, but they're going to be kind of relatively typical adolescent signs. Uh, is there a lot of pushback, a lot of withdrawal, pulling away, disconnection. We talk about connection issues, and if they start to start, well, they, they're pulling away, they're, they're not wanting to engage in family uh, activities, they're very isolated, they seem to want to stay in the room a lot, uh, they're on their phones constantly, on their computers, they may see a a reduction, a, a kind of decrease in their amount of time spent with friends. Uh, they are maybe pulling away from activities that they've in the past enjoyed, giving up their uh, football team or their violin. Uh, they're not wanting to continue to do those things that they had some passion about before. 
They may be very fatigued, tired, because they may be staying up, up late at night, not getting their rest. And some of the irritability can also come because they're having a lot of incongruence internally. They know they're doing things that they really shouldn't be. They've been asked not to, and so they, they're living this bit of a double life. And so there can be a lot of internal toxic shame that they're feeling. And many kids will then pull away because of that, because they don't want to get close and be close and be vulnerable because they may be discovered. Now, we don't want you to be alarmed because some adolescents show all of those signs and they're not dealing with, with pornography. They're just being kids. Uh, but then it's important to be diligent, just be watchful, be aware of what they're looking at, like this last session we had, understand the apps that they're looking at, what kinds of games are they playing, what are they doing with their social media. Stay close to them. In the session that we had for grandparents, really the main message in that context is create that connection so that they can share with you if they're struggling. Uh, but be connected with them. Reach out to them. Be relevant to them. Uh, be interested in the things they're doing. Stay close to them. Hear them out. Uh, but in that, in that way, you'll also see some of the subtle signs that might be there so that they'll be able to then maybe come to you and talk to you because you're safe. You're not going to just give them that lecture. Dan, I had a thought as you were talking. The list you were describing of behaviors you might see, including withdrawing, isolating, uh, being tired, not doing things they enjoyed. I was thinking, I've heard that list before. I've heard it on a list of things to look for for depression, maybe suicidality, maybe drug addiction. I mean, that list seems common. And so one thought I had is maybe when we see that list of behaviors, pornography addiction may be one of the things that we consider as a possibility, but we can take those symptoms as a hint that maybe it's time to get involved and see what we can do. To, maybe this is information that my child might be in trouble, and what can I do to be close to my child and figure out what's going on? Would you say, would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. Okay, yes. great. Anybody else? Uh, Go ahead. Terminology. Um, one of the things we have to begin talking about in our society is moving mental health from prevention, from intervention to prevention. So the list that you just quoted is an at-risk list. So when we're asking about our kids and our families, yes, it's good to say, is this a potential they could be viewing something inappropriate? It's better to say, do we have a kid that's at risk? Because suicide can lead to viewing, depression can lead to viewing, anxiety can lead to viewing. And so that list that he gave you in the clinical office is what we reference as an at-risk list. Now, what is the kid at risk for? By maintaining that connection and conversation with your young people, you can help determine what they're at risk for. Maybe it is pornography viewing, maybe it is suicide ideation, maybe it is depression. But those are at risk behaviors that we need to be mindful of. Great, thank you. Okay, it's kind of a follow-up question here from a different person, but I feel like they're related. This question says, how do I encourage my son to get help? I said that, but be willing to get help yourself. We've had, we've grown up in a world that said, pull your stuff up by the bootstraps and just get on with things, right? That's the old adage, right? We have to be willing to talk about and be open to getting help. Mental health is not a bad word, it's not a negative word. And when we're viewing any type of addiction, we go into the mental health area. And so many of us sometimes we're great to talk about cancer, diabetes, but mental health we want to put behind a door and shut it. Talk about it. In your homes, in your families, in your neighborhood, in your communities, you should be talking about mental health all the time. It shouldn't be a conversation that happens when someone's in crisis. It should be a conversation that's in the dinner table that says, you know what? Depression is really common. Addictions are really common. And guess what? People can get help, and this is how they get it. So a kid doesn't feel weird or strange when you say, you know what? We need to get you some help should be a daily part of the conversations. That's great. And it's also to uh, reducing the shame that they feel. Many will not seek help because, or even bring it up because they feel that, that shame. 
that they're again not doing something that's congruent with what they believe is right and, and what they think their parents are going to be very disturbed about. So if we create an environment in our homes where we can openly discuss mistakes, and like it's been said, that we, they see us willing to get the help, they see us willing to reach out, they see us willing to read the, the literature, the books, see mom and dad talking about these things and owning their mistakes that they've made then it sets an environment for them to be able to be willing to reach out. And that, that can be also around how we talk about sexuality itself, not just with pornography, but how do we discuss sexuality? If we know they're going through puberty, we know they're experiencing kind of the flare up of those hormones and they're having interests that if, if, we, if we have our discussions only around the, the negative feelings and the negative perspectives on sex, then we're going to shut them down from their willingness to talk to us. And there's that adage that many, we've referred to many times, if we teach children that sex is bad, sinful, and wrong, save it for the one you love, it's a confusing message. So it's bad, sinful, and wrong, but then their conclusion that they can only draw from that is then, okay, it's bad, sinful, and wrong, and that's what I, and I'm thinking about those things a lot. I've been doing some things like that. Then the only thing I can conclude is that then I'm bad and I'm wrong and I'm unworthy of love. And so then we need to set the stage for them to come to us when they start looking at pornography early, early on in our families by openly discussing sexuality from the beauty that it is its naturalness, um, being able to accept those feelings and urges and have it be done, discussed in a context that it's normal to feel those things so that when they do maybe come across pornography and struggle that they, we've already set the stage for them to feel okay about coming to us to talk to us. Also, I think, um, you know, sexual media is sort of on this range of blatant, vulgarity to borderline to and every family is having experiences with choosing sec, you know what degree of that material they're letting in their house and if you're talking about this with your kids and so kids want to watch this movie you're going oh, I don't know about that movie it doesn't look like something we want and they keep pushing it so you have this conversation you make a decision maybe there's some things in that movie you didn't like and so then you're talking about it after the movie you're saying yeah we made this decision what do you think now that we've seen it um, what it what was it in the movie that made you feel things that made you uncomfortable so you're having a lot of conversations about your experience with media it doesn't have to be clear over to pornography and you're talking about your reactions to that, both sexual feelings and others, then you're developing this environment of openness around what, what happens to you when you see things like this. And then you can ask the simple questions, what other things have you seen that have created these feelings in you? And then hopefully they will share some of that. And, and so that's the kind of openness I think you want to have in your families if you can develop it. Great, let me ask a follow-up to the previous question. So um, maybe a way to word this is, what are some of the options a parent has if they have a child who is resistant to getting help? <laughs> well, the first thing a parent can do is ask why. And it's okay. It's okay if a child has fears. It's okay if they're res resistant to get help. We don't want to force anyone um, because if you force them, the help isn't going to work. But my, my first response would be to your question is to just say, okay, why? Why are you resistant? And then respect that and then ask the child to form their own treatment plan. You know, so for example, if a child says, I don't want to go talk to somebody, say, okay, how do you think we can help? What do you think you can do? Where would you like us to go? And then that puts the control back in the child's hands to begin to explore what they need. And if the parent is open, and even the parent can say, okay, if you don't want to get a help, go get help, that's fine. I need help so that I can help you. And so there's a lot of ways we can do that without being saying, well, you're going no matter what. Right, so it sounds like what you're saying is that the parent can say, 
well, I could use some guidance. You know, clearly I'm baffled. I don't know how to help you when you're refusing to get help. So maybe a professional can help me know what to do next. Yeah, it's great advice. Okay, next question. Oh, before I do, does anyone have any questions from the audience? Please go ahead. You can stand at the microphone there. And anyone else who would like to, if you wouldn't mind just coming up to the microphone also. So with pornography comes a lot of uh, self-hate. Yes. Um, are there any suggestions for helping somebody to rebuild that, uh, rebuilding self-esteem? You know, there's one thing I'd love for us to eliminate in our culture, and I've heard this many times. When we talk about making a mistake, we use two words that create this self-hatred that you're talking about. We use the word guilt and we use the word shame. And the word that we should all be using is remorse. Because remorse, it means that we have made a mistake. And there's not a person in this room that hasn't made a mistake. And mistakes can be corrected and undone at times, depending on what the mistake is. But when we use the words like guilt or shame, that simply means we think the person is bad. So number one, I think the first thing people have to do in self-hatred to begin correcting that and, and liking themselves is realize that they have the right to have remorse. And it's okay to feel sorry that a mistake was made and to realize you made a mistake. You're not a bad person. We should remove labels. One of the things I don't like about a 12-step program, and I may be different than other clinicians, but I don't like the fact that people stand up and say, hi, I'm an alcoholic. A person cannot be fixed, but a problem can be. And when we label, then we cripple. And so it's really important not to label. It's important for a person to say, I have an alcoholic problem, because guess what we can do with a problem? We can find a solution. So my advice would be, first of all, realize that people can feel remorse. And second of all, don't label yourself or label anyone else. They're a beautiful son or daughter of God who can be as amazing as they intended to be, regardless of the path that they started on. I like the, I like the mindfulness material a lot. Um, that material, it, it, it's a, an approach to change and growth. It starts from the ex, an acceptance place, and it, it really helps you resist going backwards in time, because whatever you have done yesterday is in the past. And today is, is the thing that you learn to embrace in mindfulness. So even if yesterday was a bad day, um, today is a new day. And if you can start from accepting and appreciating the beauty of today, then you can start to uh, turn that, that uh, self-talk a little bit from all these horrible things I've done and all these ways I've been to today's a new day. I have a new opportunity to be... Uh, to, to approach this day differently. And, and anyway, it's showing some pretty good success in helping with some very difficult problems because, again, it keeps people from keep persistently focusing on yesterday's mistakes. Dr. Busby, do you have a place where you would send someone to find more information about mindfulness? Um, there's a, there's a, a lot of it out there. Um, I just uh, went through a, an extensive course by a professor from Harvard. If you give me a second, I'll look it up, and then I'll, I'll put the oh, name. Oh, good up. idea. Yeah. Were you going to say something? Mark. Yeah, I'll say something while he's looking at. Um, one of the things that, that we do in our ministry, and um, whether it's with betrayed spouses or um, people that are struggling, is for them to objectively look at actually the messages that they are saying. So we'll actually have them write out what are the self-hate messages that you're believing to be true about yourself. I'm not enough, you know, I'm not a beloved or whatever. And so they actually write those out, which we obviously we call them lies, but then we counter them with the truth so that when that negative message comes, they actually have a counter to that. I am, you know, and we take, obviously we go to the scriptures, Psalm 119, I am, you know, fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a beloved daughter or a beloved son, Galatians 4, 4. And so they're actually writing those out. And it's almost like we say, you know, if there's a tornado or whatever, you kind of have your emergency procedures, like keep this in your, in your pocket or keep this in your car, or keep it in your wallet. And when those negative messages come, just pull that out. And now you're, because we behave out of a belief system. So we've got to, we've got to redo sometimes that stinking thinking and, and bringing those truth, truthful messages in until they are almost repetitive. Excellent. 
dead. Here we go. The reference is Ronald D. Siegel, The Science of Mindfulness, A Research-Based Path to Well-Being. That's one reference. He, uh, he references a lot of other people, a lot of other sources. He has a book as well, I believe. Again, his last name is spelled S-I-E-G-E-L. He's a professor at Harvard. He's a clinician, actually. Um, uh, great stuff, um, and, and, and it's, this is just a beginning sort of course on that, but he goes over everything from addictions to eating disorders to all kinds of ways that this is useful, and so. Thank you. Um, Carl, there's, oh, go ahead. There's a real practical uh, resource as well. Uh, Time Magazine came out a few months ago uh, with a special edition on mindfulness. Well, in fact, about two years ago, they came out with their first edition, and it was uh, kind of a great introduction to mindfulness. Uh, then the second edition came out this last year, I believe in January. The whole article uh, or the publication is on mindfulness, and the reason I, I use it a lot is because it's very practical. Each chapter is about three or four pages, and it has references to a lot of the research that's done and some practical perspectives on uh, practices that we can engage in every day, mindful meditation practices, uh, the importance of gratitude, a lot of other kinds of things that come into mindfulness, uh, practices in meditation. And it's, so that, that's a great resource if you just want a real quick kind of reference. It's Time Magazine Special Edition on Mindfulness. As you think about, and one thing to add on your mindfulness, which I think is really great, Remember the trauma has to be moved for the mindfulness to be effective. So if there's trauma that hasn't been addressed, you have to go through the process of mending the trauma and then the mindfulness pieces come to play. If trauma isn't addressed first, the mindfulness won't be as effective as the trauma removal. And so a way to address that trauma would be with the help of a trained professional. Yes, right? if yes. necessary. So just if remember necessary. that Sometimes we get caught, not that mindfulness isn't important, don't misquote me, but mindfulness is really important, but if we haven't really dealt with the trauma, we can say all the affirmations we want, but we're not going to get where we need to be if the trauma hasn't been addressed. Thank you. Jeff Ford was going to jump in with a comment, too. Jeff is the, you've heard from him today, but he so, is the chair of our planning committee and a member of the board of UCAP and, and a therapist. Go and ahead. the guy who can't keep quiet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I love all those responses. They're, a lot of them are very individual based, but... The question about um, dealing with self-hatred, it has to involve another person. You have to find someone to tell them how horrible you feel. I love the example that we had today from Spencer Cox when he shared about that, that uh, person in his church community who he was able to talk to. He was feeling suicidal. He was able to talk to this person and tell him just how bad he felt. When we experience reaching out, telling someone how bad we really feel, and that person actually responds with love, that gives us hope that we can maybe even start loving ourselves. Nobody can get better with shame or self-hatred by themselves. It is impossible. If, you, if we don't even have enough love to love ourselves, we all have to rely on other people's love. No matter how much mindfulness or affirmations it has to have another person. We have to have the courage to tell someone how we really feel. Thanks, I'm glad you spoke up. Does anyone else from the audience have any questions or comments? Yes, please. I'll repeat her question. Why do we think that the suicide rate in Utah is higher than other states in the country? You're looking at I'm guessing you're looking at the adolescent rate of teenage suicide, right? Well, first of all, I think statistics can be skewed, so I'll give you, because I've done a lot of research in this area. Um, one of the problems that we deal with in the West, particularly in Utah, is when we end up with suicides for our young people, they're very clear suicides because of the manner in which the lives end. In other cultures, alcohol and drugs can also be related, and they don't get identified as suicidal deaths because they were either a car accident or an overdose. And so part of the reason is just the way in which, um, because of the culture of our community and the primary faith, um, comes into factor. So I don't know that we're necessarily 
that far out from other states based on data being gathered. But other issues that we deal with in particular is we have a stronger perfectionistic culture that plays within our community than other areas. And that perfectionistic culture isn't necessarily the faith of people around, but sometimes it gets translated wrong. And so for our young people in particular in the state of Utah, there appears to be an overwhelming perspective of need to be perfect to be accepted. And when things happen that change that, we, we see them making some very difficult finality situations. On the suicide rate in the 1990s is when they were as high as they are now. And in the 1990s is when the internet came into play. And then now we have the electronic issues. So, and I lectured on that if you heard my lecture about um, electronics and impacting. But just understand that we, we get a bad rap here, but part of it is because of unfortunately how the kids end their lives. And then we really have to look at the culture of what we're presenting to our young people because that plays a strong point in the suicide ideation in Utah. I think I'll just finish with this last question. And to our panel, thank you so much. We appreciate your input. How long does it take to rebuild trust in a relationship assuming the individuals are working recovery? A long time. <laughs> and I don't mean to be flippant with that, but it's true. Um, there's not really a specific time that we can really expect, but there has to be two ingredients generally for that trust. There needs to be experience and time. And so to build trust, there needs to be experience of a trustworthy person. So the, the individual trying to build back the trust needs to be more transparent, more open, more willing to share, more truthful, no more secrets, uh, disclosing, being attentive to others' needs. And as that happens over a long extended period of time, then trust and safety then can be built. But those two pieces need to be there. I think it's interesting you say that. I've heard this thought several times that it's not helpful to encourage someone to trust someone who is not trustworthy. That's not going to result in anything positive. And so maybe then the ingredients that you talked about need to be there in order for that person to build trust. And it also means that maybe it's not helpful for someone who's been struggling with pornography to set a time limit on their spouse and why aren't you over this yet? This happened a long time ago, things like that. Is that what you were re referring to? Yeah, that's right. And realizing too with either compulsive behaviors of this nature or uh, addiction, if we want to call it that, that it's common to have relapses. It's common to have slips. Uh, it's common to have a return to those behaviors. And usually the issue is not that there are relapses, but am I honest in my then disclosing of that? Uh, am I willing to then share within we have a 24-hour rule with some of our, our clients where they are willing within 24 hours to share a relapse with their partner or with someone that they're reporting to. And if they're willing to do that, that many times then begins the process of that, that building of trust over time that, okay, he may slip, he may have a problem, but he's going to tell me and I don't have to then constantly be wondering and filling in the gaps and getting gaslighted if he's then not disclosing and then making me feel like I'm crazy. So it, that's it, it, knowing that addiction recovery takes time, that there needs to be that foundation of honesty and, dis, and uh, um, openness. We're so thankful to all of you for joining us at the conference today. It just is so meaningful to come together in a common cause. And please let's thank our wonderful panel. <laughs>